Good morning, Renovation Church. Good to see all of you here this morning. Uh, today we are continuing in the magnificent book of Revelation. And, uh, you know, this book is a puzzle to many people. Just out of curiosity, how many of you like jigsaw puzzles? How many of you like jigsaw puzzles? Okay, a few of you. Uh, my mother loves jigsaw puzzles. Uh, she lives in Illinois with her twin sister, and uh, they, for fun, one of the things they do is they, they uh, do jigsaw puzzles. And uh, when I go visit her, when I'm on a vacation or something, uh, she loves it when I sit down and do a jigsaw puzzle with them. And I have to be honest with you, I absolutely hate it. I hate jigsaw puzzles. And there's nothing wrong with jigsaw puzzles, it's just I don't... I, I don't, I'm, I'm a kind of ADD, and I have a hard time sitting still, and I feel like I'm just wasting my time with this puzzle. Like, this is a perfectly good table. You got this puzzle on it. There could be food on that table. You got a puzzle on it, and, they, and you get it so excited, you know, everybody's looking for the edge pieces, and I, I found a corner piece, and I'm just, I lose my mind with jigsaw puzzles. Matter of fact, I had a friend, um, years ago that loved jigsaw puzzles and he had this massive one it was like of a monet painting really hard puzzle and he got all the way down to the last piece of the puzzle and while he was uh, doing the puzzle he was eating doritos and he accidentally ate a the puzzle piece the last puzzle piece of that puzzle and ever since then he's been looking for his inner piece i'm sorry i'm sorry it's a dad joke there. It's a great dad joke. But anyway, when it comes to the book of Revelation, it's a puzzle to many people. And because of that, many people I've found, many people who have gone to church their entire lives haven't even read the book of Revelation. They think it's too intimidating, too confusing. Matter of fact, years ago I was at a church, and uh, it was a great church. I mean, a uh, long history, 100-year history of that church at least, and uh, they had not studied the book of Re Revelation. They had had preaching on it for a long time. I asked why that was, and they told me that a uh, previous pastor of that church refused to preach the book of Revelation because he said it was too confusing. And that is not uncommon. Many churches do not preach on the book of Revelation Revelation, and they don't preach on prophecy at all. And that's a shame because at least a quarter of the Bible is prophecy, so you're leaving out a lot of content in the Bible if you're never preaching on prophecy. And the book of Revelation itself we saw last week, Jesus himself clearly uh, asserts that the book of Revelation is meant to be understood and undertaken. That is, God wants us to learn the book and to live the book, to live the principles of the book. So let's dive in today. As you can tell from your outline, we have a lot to cover. I'm going to give you a Bible study. This is going to be an old-fashioned Bible study this morning, and I hope it blesses you. We're going to look at chapters 2 through 3 today. Um, so I invite you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. And I want to begin with a review of the previous two messages. I gave an introductory message two weeks ago. I started with chapter one last week. And in the introductory message, I gave you a teaching about uh, an event called the rapture. Uh, that's what it's called in theology. And we're going to review some of that because some of you weren't able to attend that service. Um, First of all, we find in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, we saw this last week, Jesus gives us a major key to understanding the book of Revelation. He gives us an outline of the book. In Revelation 1, 19, he says this, Write, therefore, he's speaking to St. John, John the, the apostle, what, Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. So, Jesus breaks up the book into three parts, and he gives us an outline of the book. Chapter one is the what you have seen. John, I want you to write down what you've just seen. That's chapter 
1. That's John's immediate past, and it is focused on the person of Christ. We see Jesus in his glorified form. We are given in chapter 1 the most uh, detailed description of Jesus Christ in the entire Bible, and he is presented as awesome with much power and glory, and the message is clear. This book is about Jesus Christ. Uh, The book of Revelation is about the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the book of Revelations, plural. It's the revelation. And it is primarily about the glory of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of aspects of Jesus that we've never seen before, particularly the second coming of Christ when he comes as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the judge of the world. Chapters two through three are the second section of the book of Revelation. Jesus says, I want you to write down what you have seen. The second section, I want you to write what is now. What's now to you, John? John's present situation, which is concerned about the possession of Christ, particularly his church. If you have accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you're living the gospel of Jesus Christ, You love Jesus, you're a follower of Jesus, you are part of this thing that the Bible calls the church, God's people. And that's what chapters two through three are about in John's day, what John was presently experiencing. And we'll look at that today. And Jesus gives through those two chapters messages to seven churches that were existing during John's time. And he evaluates these churches, and it's important for us to read this and study this because those evaluations can also be used as evaluations of our spiritual lives in our churches today. And then chapters 4 through 22, uh, the book is broken down into, that's the next section, and that is John's future perspective, which has to do with what will take place later, according to Jesus, and that is the program of Christ or the end of the world as we know it. When you study the Bible, you will notice, when you study especially prophecy, you will notice that the Bible uses the term age a lot. And so the Bible breaks history down into various ages. Um, In my studies, I think there are at least seven ages in world history that God has organized history around, but there are two prominent ones, and that's why we we know this kind of instinctively, because when you pick up your Bible, there are two big sections of it, right? There's the old what? The Old Testament, and there's the New Testament, right? Why is that? Well, the word testament means covenant, or arrangement, or contract, Um, and this is, uh, so the word or testament has the idea of how God deals with you at a certain period in time, okay? So the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the dominant age of the Old Testament is the age of the law, the covenant of the law. God gives Moses, the great Moses, the magnificent Ten Commandments, and from those Ten Commandments emanate over 600 detailed laws or rules that God gives his people, and there's a message in those rules, okay? There's a message in the covenant. And here's the message. Some people say to God, you know, I think I can get to heaven by my own good works. And God says, okay, I'll take you up on that proposition. Here are 600 rules that you can never break. You can't break even one of them. If you manage to pull that off, you've earned your way into heaven. Well, the human race attempted that, and not one person was able to keep every single rule. Uh, There was only one person in all history who perfectly kept that, all the rules, and his name is Jesus Christ, okay? So the message of the Old Covenant, the message of the law, the message of the Old Testament is we cannot earn our way to heaven. We are not perfect. We need help. We need a savior, okay? And then Jesus comes along as the son of God. He becomes one of us. 
he does perfectly obey all 600 rules of the law of the covenant, and then he dies on the cross, and he pays for our failure to live up to God's standards, okay? So he takes on the wrath of God, the judgment of God for the fact that we are sinners, and his blood pays for our sins. And he turns around and he offers to pay for your sins and for my sins, and he rises again, proving that he can do that. And we now have the New Testament, the New Covenant, which is a covenant of grace. We do not approach God on the basis of a code of conduct. We do not approach God with the idea, I'm gonna be good enough, I'm gonna be worthy enough to go to your house when I die, God. I'm not good enough. I need a savior, and Jesus is that savior, and his blood pays for me, pays for you to go to heaven. That's an amen moment right there. Can I get an amen? That is the great news of the new covenant. So we are right now, when it comes to the program of God, at this point in history, we are in the age of grace. Okay, the age of grace. Grace meaning, here's a good way to remember what grace means. G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Unmerited favor, kindness we don't deserve because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But chapters four through 22 are talking about the future, the next age, okay? And in theology, this can be called the age of the future kingdom. We're in the age of grace right now. The next big age is the age of the future kingdom of God. And it includes the end of the world, okay? The next big section of history at the beginning of the age of the future kingdom is called, this period is called the tribulation in the Bible. And it is exactly seven years long, okay? The prophet Daniel tells us that the tribulation period will be exactly seven years long. And it will be absolutely horrifying. The term tribulation in the Bible has the idea of great affliction, anguish, extreme pain. Same word is used of a woman in the Bible who is in the distress of childbirth, some, a woman who is having a hard time delivering a child and feeling the enormous pain of that. Uh, the same word is used of the pain that, uh, the excruciating pain that Jesus experienced as he was being crucified. This will be a time of astounding, dreadful judgment on the world. It will be the worst time in world history ever. It will be worse than World War II. It will be worse than Vietnam. It'll, it'll make COVID look like nothing uh, this time. It will be absolutely terrifying. It will be worse than any horror movie you have ever seen in your life. Uh, you don't want to be in the tribulation. So the question is, how do we escape it? How can we make sure that we don't have to go through what the Bible describes as the time of God's wrath? Well, the answer to that question is there is an event that will happen right before the tribulation starts, immediately before the tribulation starts, and that event in theology is called the rapture. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about the rapture and its timing. Uh, let me give you a technical definition of this event. The rapture refers to the unpredictable, quick, and dramatic disappearance of the church caused by the mid-air return of Jesus Christ to take us to the dimension of heaven. The rapture refers to the unpredictable, quick, and dramatic disappearance of the church caused by the mid-air return of Jesus Christ to take us to the dimension of heaven. When I look at the rapture in Scripture, I immediately think of this as a transporter event. Matter of fact, the early, uh, some of the early church fathers referred to it as the translation 
meaning a movement from one place to another, a movement from one state to another, I think of Star Trek. You know, in Star Trek, uh, they have the transporter, right? And they're able to instantly beam somebody up. I mean, you know, so Captain Kirk will be on an ice planet in a abominable snow monster will be coming and about to eat him and he'll he'll get on his uh, communicator and he'll go Scotty you gotta beam me up right now and Scotty can't do it because the engine's down he goes I can't do it captain I just can't do it Scotty beam me up right now all right captain but it may blow up the ship do it Scotty and then he gets beamed up immediately right that's gonna happen to the people of God one day in the future and I think quite literally that's the way it's gonna look let me show you what I mean. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. This is St. Paul, the Apostle Paul himself, and he says, For the Lord himself will come down from he heaven and with a loud command. So this is going to be very dramatic, okay? With the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet, trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So there's going to be a massive resurrection at this event. And so that refers to the dead in Christ. That means everybody who's ever accepted Christ who is now dead. So from Acts chapter 2, 2,000 years ago to now, every Christian will be resurrected at this event. So the dead in Christ, they're going to rise first at this event. And then verse 17 says, after that, we who are still alive, so if you're still alive when this event happens and you're left, you will be caught up together with them in the clouds. So the entire church of all history is going to be what the Bible says, caught up. Now, if we were reading this in the Latin Vulgate, uh, the uh, official translation of the Catholic Church, okay, the word for caught up there would be rapture, raptura. And that's where we get the term rapture from. We will be caught up, we will be raptured together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We'll somehow meet him in the air. We go up. When you die right now, let's say you died on your way home in a car accident, the moment you die, your spirit meets the Lord. You go up and you go to heaven. But at the rapture, the difference is that your body will also go up. And you will be given a brand new body, a heavenly body that can handle heaven. The Bible says that that body will be indestructible. I can't wait to have that body. No more gut. I'm not going to have a gut in heaven. And I think it's going to happen so fast. The text indicates that it, it happens in the twinkling of an eye. Okay, so I think it's going to be so fast, it's going to be like a beam. It's going to be, we're going to be gone, boom, instantly. We will disappear instantly. And, and the world is going to be shocked, and it will throw the world into mass chaos. When a billion, over a billion people are gone instantly, and economies will collapse and it will be the prime setting for a world leader to take charge, and that will be the Antichrist. Okay? And so Jesus, or uh, Paul says, and so we will be with the Lord forever. And then he says something fascinating. He says, therefore, encourage each other with these words. The rapture is supposed to encourage us. The indication seems to be that the next big event is going to be the rapture. I want you to be encouraged about the end times, what Paul seems to be saying. Saying. Now, some think the, the rapture will happen before the tribulation. Some say it will happen in the middle of the tribulation. And some say it will happen after the tribulation and the church will have to go through this time of judgment. Let me give you some reasons why, some strong reasons why I think it will happen before the tribulation or the end of the world as we know it. Verse one, or number, reason number one, is that it will be un predictable. The rapture will be unpredictable. John chapter 14, Jesus is talking to his disciples who represent the church, so he's talking to us. And uh, the disciples at this time are very discouraged. Jesus is encouraging them. He's about to be crucified. And he says, I want to give you some hope. 
You're about to face this horrifying event. I'm going to be gone for a while. I'm going to leave you. But let me tell you what's going to happen to you in the end times, okay? John chapter 14, verses 2 through 3 says, My Father's house has many rooms. What's he talking about? What's the Father's house? That's heaven. So Jesus is saying heaven's big, okay? It can accommodate us, all right? It can accommodate the entire church throughout all time, right? It has many, many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going... I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. He's referring to the rapture. And I will take you, I will snatch you, I will rapture you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. Now now notice that Jesus seems to be saying that the next big thing prophetically for his disciples is that he's coming back for them. And he's not talking about the second coming here, because when he comes back in the second coming, it will be as the judge. He will be coming back as the Lord of lords, and he will judge the world. He says, I'm going to come back for you first, and I'm going to take you to be with me. And he doesn't say anything about massive earthquakes or plagues or judgment or a horrifying world war, which is what will happen in the tribulation. He seems to be encouraging us that right now, hey, I'm preparing a place for you in my Father's house. I'm preparing a home for you in heaven, and he says, I'm going to take you there one day. Okay, I'm gonna, There's going to be this big event, and I'm going to take you. And by the way, I can't wait for this event. I can't wait to see the home that God is preparing for me. Don't you love it when somebody prepares for you, you know, like if you go visit someone and they've prepared a room for you or uh, they prepared their house for you and they, they've asked what your favorite foods are, you know, what you like to do, what your favorite shows are, and they've got all of that. A couple of years ago, my kids, I've got grown kids, and my four kids got together, and this is just a wonderful thing, and they pooled their resources and I had mentioned to them that on my bucket list, I want to go to the Broadmoor one day. I want to stay in the Broadmoor. Uh, We can't afford that. And I just mentioned it one time. I found out that the Broadmoor, uh, according to many publications, is the number one hotel, highest ranked hotel in the world. And I'm like, man, it's right in our backyard. I would like to stay there one day, but we really can't afford it. And so they, they got together and they got us a room in the Broadmoor, Judy and me, for one night. And I want to tell you, it lived up to the expectations. I mean, those people remembered our names, you know. We'd call down and ask a question, yes, Mr. Hayes. Yes, Mrs. Hayes, you know. Welcome, Rusty and Judy. You know, we go into the room and everything's clean and, you know, all the sheets are brand new and uh, they got chocolates on the pillows and, you know, the, the little mini fridge is all stocked with all kinds of snacks, like Snickers bars and all kinds of good stuff. And, and you go into the bathroom, they got robes and, and uh, they had little slippers for us, you know. So I went in the bathroom, I got into that robe, man. Robes are a strange piece of garment, aren't they? That, that's a strange garment. I mean, really, let's be honest. The only person that looks good in a robe is Santa Claus. And so I come out the room, I'm like, hey, what do you think of this, baby? She goes, you look like Santa Claus. And I'm like, you're welcome, you know. And so I get into the mini fridge and eat all the snacks and cost $1,000. And we had a great time. But anyway, the point is, God is preparing a home for us. He's preparing a place for us. And I want you to imagine that for a minute. Jesus is preparing a place for you in heaven, a home for you. And I I don't think we realize this, but heaven is our home. It is our home. And your your instincts know this. Let me give you, uh, let me prove this to you. Have you ever been in a perfect family situation, you're at your house, your family's there, you know, it might be for Christmas or something, you got the meal and everybody's laughing and all the kids are happy and and everything's just perfect. It's one of those moments that's just perfect and a sadness comes over you. This happens to me every holiday. 
I sat, I'll be looking at my kids laughing, and we'll be drinking eggnog and opening the presents, and a moment of sadness comes over me. And the sadness is, this moment is going to pass, right? I can't hold on to it. It's, it's going to be gone. It, it's gone in an instant. And it makes me sad because every now and then I get a taste of heaven, but I can't hold on to it. C.S. Lewis, the great author that wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he was a Christian. He was a Christian philosopher. And he said, all of us have a homesickness for a place we've never seen. Our home is heaven. When we get to heaven, those moments won't end. And Jesus says, I'm going to prepare, prepare your home for you in my Father's house in heaven. So just imagine this. Here's the deal. When you get to heaven, you will feel more at home than any home you have ever experienced in your entire life. Why? Because your maker is preparing the home for you. And you'll finally be home. The Bible says that we are citizens of a far off country. Our home is heaven. And we're headed there because of Jesus. Amen? Isn't that awesome to think about? And the event where we get an escort to our home is the rapture. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare this place for you. And I'm going to come back and get you. And I'm going to take you there. All right? And that seems like the next event when Jesus is talking, and it appears to be unpredictable in Scripture. In other words, it could happen in the next five minutes. It's not going to be announced. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 52, the Apostle Paul is talking. He's talking about the rapture. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, so we're not all going to be dead. Not everybody's going to be dead when this event happens, when the Bible talks about death with Christians. It uses the metaphor of sleep. But we will all be changed. We're, all, we're going to be given new bodies. We're going to be purified at the rapture. And then he talks about the unpredictability of it. Verse 52, he says, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. That's referring to the rapture. It will happen instantly, unpredictably, in a flash. Now, if it happens in the middle of the tribulation, it's not unpredictable. If it happens at the end of the tribulation, it's not unpredictable because we are given all kinds of specifics in the Bible about the tribulation. For example, we're told that the tribulation begins when a major treaty in the Middle East takes place, brokered by a very charismatic world leader. He'll bring peace to the Middle East in Israel, finally, that will be a massive event. He will be the Antichrist. As soon as that treaty is signed, the clock will start. And it will be exactly seven years until the end of the tribulation. So if the rapture happens in the middle of the tribulation, you could predict it. You can say, okay, three and a half years from now, we're going to be raptured. Or if it happens at the end of the tribulation, you can predict it exactly the day from that treaty. So if it's in the middle or at the end, it takes away the doctrine, which is called the doctrine of eminence, or the unpredictable nature of the rapture. Second reason that I think it will happen before the tribulation is that it is linked with rescuing the church from God's wrath. The, the rapture is linked with rescue. The rapture is a rescue. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 9 through 10 says this. I think this is very clear. Okay, I think this, when you're reading this, it just seems like the natural reading of the text. You tell me what you think. Verse 9, Paul is talking about the church. He says, they tell us how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait, the next big thing, we're, we're waiting for his son, for Jesus from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who what? Who rescues us from the coming wrath. Okay, the coming wrath. The tribulation is described as wrath, God's wrath in the Bible. And very, there in black and white, Paul tells us Jesus rescues us from the coming wrath. Okay, we're rescued from the tribulation. Now, how are we rescued? 
Well, we're taken home. We're raptured. Look at, verse, uh, look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. I mean, I, I think this is a slam dunk, uh, in my opinion. But Paul says this, for God did not appoint us as Christians to suffer wrath, but to receive what? Salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, we are not appointed to suffer wrath. Do we deserve God's wrath? Do we deserve to go through the tribulation? Yes. Everybody in this room deserves to go through the tribulation. We're all sinners in the eyes of God. However, Jesus died. There's this little thing called the cross. It's amazing to me how people can go to church their entire lives and they just think the cross is a symbol. They don't get it. They don't understand that the reason that Jesus died on the cross, he wasn't a victim. He did that on purpose. He paid for the wrath of God. He took on the wrath of God himself and he gave us credit for it. And that's why we are not appointed to suffer wrath. It has nothing to do with our deeds or whether or not we're good are bad or deserve to go through the wrath of God. We deserve it, but we're not appointed it because of Jesus, amen? So we are saved by the rapture. Last reason I think it will happen before the tribulation, and this is a strong argument. I had a professor in seminary who gave 50 reasons why he believed the rapture happened before the tribulation. I'm just giving you three, but this is another strong one. There are no New Testament passages about the tribulation that refer to the church, okay? You can read the entire Bible and you will find no reference to the church in the tribulation, right? We will see this in the book of Revelation itself. In chapters one through three, you'll see the word church numerous times. Many times the word church is used in chapters one through three of the book of Revelation. But when you get to chapter four, which starts the tribulation, and you read all of that section about the tribulation, not once is the word church used. That's odd if the church is in the tribu tribulation. Why would Jesus and Gabriel and John use the word church so much in, in chapters one through three, but when he's looking at the future, he doesn't use the church in the tribulation? So it's likely that we who call on Jesus will be rescued from the end of the world. And that encourages me. I find that very, very encouraging. And that's, I think, why Paul says, therefore encourage one another with these words. All right? But there is something here that's not so encouraging. And the message is going to take a turn right now. And I'm going to preach to you, old-style preaching. Uh, the, the old Southern Baptist in me is going to come out, y'all, and I'm going to do some preaching. And we're going to evaluate where we are before the Lord. Jesus says something not so encouraging in Matthew 7, 21 and elsewhere. He says, not everybody who calls him Lord is really his. He implies that there are people all over the world who go to church and claim to be Christians, and they pray to him, and they wear crosses, and they even read their Bibles, and he says, I don't know them. I don't know these people. They are not mine. They will not be saved. And he gives us some warning signs to help us make sure that we are really his. I went to the dentist the other day, and no offense if you're a dentist, um, uh, dentists are wonderful people. Uh, uh, you know, I've pastored dentists before, and, and I would say every one of them I've met, pretty much, they're, they're wonderful people, and they try really hard. They try to make your visit with them pleasant and enjoyable. I mean, my dentist, he's got free coffee. He gives you all kinds of free stuff. You get free hand sanitizer. You know, they give you free toothbrushes and free toothpaste and all kinds of stuff, free floss, and, you know, it's all, it's all this free stuff, and and their offices are nice, and the chairs are comfortable that they put you in, and they even try to have small talk with you to make you feel comfortable, right? Uh, I recently had a crown uh, put back on, my, on a tooth, and 
The dentist is talking to me the whole time. You know, he's trying to make me feel comfortable while his entire fist is in my mouth, right? He knows I'm a coach at Palmer Ridge High School, and he's like, so how's the football team looking this year? And I'm like, oh, it looks pretty good. Yeah, I think we're having a good year. You know, it's miserable. It's a miserable experience, right? And every time I go to the dentist, he wants to do an x-ray of my mouth which is also unpleasant. They put that thing in your mouth, you gotta bite down, and then they stick that cold thing on your cheek, and they all run you know, to the uh, bomb shelter while the thing goes up, and uh, I, you know, it's not enjoyable. And I asked him, why do, you gotta, why do you gotta x-ray me every time? And the reason is, he's looking for something wrong, right? He's looking for something hidden through the x-ray. He's looking for that kernel of popcorn that's stuck underneath my molar from two years ago going to the movies, you know? He's looking for warning signs that something's wrong. What if there could be an x-ray machine of our souls? What would Jesus see if he x-rayed every one of our souls? Well, Jesus gives us an x-ray of our souls in the next two chapters, chapters two through three. And he speaks to seven churches, and he evaluates them. And those evaluations are still valid today as we look at our own church, as we look at our hearts before God. And he gives seven messages. Five of them are warning signs, okay? Five of these messages are warning signs that something is seriously wrong if we have these things in our lives. And we may not be his, Okay? He begins with the Ephesian sign. Uh, he's referring to a church that's in a town called Ephesus. Uh, and I think the reason he starts with Ephesus is because John, St. John, who's giving this revelation to, is very close to this church. John had spoken at this church, preached at this church. Matter of fact, when John is released from prison, he goes back and he pastors this church. And the sign that he says to them that, there's a warning, here's a warning signal. You have lost your passion for me. If you have no passion for Jesus, that is a warning sign. They had neglected their love for the Lord. Look at Revelation 2, verse 4. Jesus says, Yet I hold this against you, Ephesian church. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Ephesus had been a great church at one time. Um, the Apostle Paul himself had preached there for years. John had preached there. They had, they had many distinguished great men and women that were a part of this church. Um, John, as I said, would become one of their pastors after he was released. Uh, this church was known as a very conservative church, very respectable church. Uh, they were known to speak out th about things that were wrong in the culture. They behaved themselves. Uh, it reminds me of, of one of the churches I grew up in. I grew up in uh, southern Louisiana. Grew up in a, in a very fundamentalist uh, conservative church. Uh, we dressed up. I mean, I would never wear what I'm wearing right now to the church I grew up in. I mean, even as a boy, I wore a coat and tie when I went to church. Everything was clean in that church. They literally had a red carpet that just seemed holy down the center aisle, we had pews, we had uh, stained glass, we had a massive organ, we had a choir loft with robes, like uh, perfectly pressed, clean robes with the choir. Uh, the pastors were very, very professional. Um, they were all doctor something, you know. Uh, I have a doctorate, but I never use it because it feels so formal to me. I never say I'm doctor. Hayes, but in that church, you referred to the pastor as Dr. So-and-so, right? And um, you smiled in that church, but very rarely did you laugh during a, a sermon. And it was very, you know, very buttoned up, and we all looked perfect. And that was kind of the culture of the church. It, you know, if somebody said, hey, how you doing? You didn't tell what was really going on. You said, I'm doing great, you know? And you went to church to look like you had it all together, right? And it was very respectable. I mean, these were good people. And they spoke out about things, and they told you who to vote for. And it was always the conservative candidate. And if you didn't vote for this party, you know, you weren't Christian. It was kind of the, 
thing about that church, and I'm not saying that that church was not pleasing to God, but Ephesus was that in, on steroids, okay, the church at Ephesus. Very respectable church, but nobody enjoyed God. You know, you went to church and it was, you had to straighten up and there wasn't freedom there. And Jesus says, look, I appreciate the fact that you have a lot of duty going on here, but you're not, you don't enjoy me. You have lost your passion for me. And that's a warning sign. I'm concerned about that. Let me put it this way. Judy and I just celebrated our 32nd wedding anniversary. Can you believe that? 32 years I've been married to Judy, and it's been delightful. I love her to death. And, and because I love her so much, I, uh, I wanted to celebrate our anniversary. So I'm the romantic in the family, and I arranged for us to get away as a celebration. And so I rented an Airbnb up in the mountains. We went away for a couple of days, and I took care of everything. I mean, I cooked this gourmet meal for Judy, steaks, like really thick steaks. Uh, I made sure the place smelled good. I put on my Old Spice, you know. I uh, put on some jazz music, had everything just right, you know, for our anniversary celebration. Now, I want to give you a hypothetical. I want you to imagine that you're Judy. And so just imagine if Judy came up to me and she said, you know, Rusty, I really love all this. Why did you do this for me? I want you to imagine my answer is this. Well, honey, it's my duty. I've been married for 32 years. A good husband celebrates his anniversary. It's my job to do that. I really don't enjoy you that much, and I don't really want to be around you that much, but it's my duty to celebrate our anniversary. How do you think that would have gone over with my wife? Let's just say that uh, there'd be no spice in the old spice, right? There would be a problem. Our marriage would be in serious trouble because I had lost my passion for my wife. God wants more than your duty. He wants more than a code of conduct from you. He wants your heart. He wants you to love him because he adores you. He wants your passion. If you don't have a passion for God, there's something wrong. That's a warning sign. The next sign is the Pergamum sign, the Pergamum sign, which is sexual and spiritual compromise. If you are compromising yourself sexually or spiritually without any remorse, I'm not talking about struggling with temptation here. I'm talking about you're engaging in behavior that is unbiblical and you have no remorse about it. Something's wrong, okay? Revelation 2, verses 14 through 15. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, Pergamum. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, it's a false prophet, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, so they ate food sacrificed to idols. They engaged in worship of other gods. In other words, they engaged with the occult. And they committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, or Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans were like a cult-like group. And the city of Pergamum was a university town at that time, and there's something about university towns. You know, we see the same type of thing today. Uh, There's a lot of sexual immorality around university towns. That's, That's common. And there's often a lot of occult activity. I'm not sure why that is, but, you know, I went to the University of Colorado in Boulder, and I can tell you, when I went to Boulder, there was sexual immorality everywhere. Everybody was engaged in it, and it was without guilt, without remorse. And there was a ton of occult activity in Boulder, Colorado. All kinds of variant religious movements uh, competing for the true faith, right? And that Boulder still that way, and that was happening here, and there were a lot of people in the church there that were compromising their sexual purity, they were dabbling in the occult, and they saw nothing wrong with it, okay? And and Jesus says, that's a problem, that's a warning sign, you may not be mine. 
Years ago, I was at a church, and a, and a couple came to me for marriage counseling, and they said, Pastor Rusty, we're having a real hard time. They came to my office, and they said, we're having a hard time in our romantic life. Like, we're just, we're not, we're not connecting romantically. And, you know, I said, well, talk to me about it. And, and, and this is the wife was talking, and she, she just casually, like, like it was nothing. She said, yeah, we've tried all kinds of things. I mean, we've been watching pornography, and, you know, we had a couple over the other day, and uh, we switched partners together, and we thought, you know, maybe that'll stimulate our, our romance. And, and, I'm like, and then she just kept going on. I went, hang on a second. Did you just say that you two are watching pornography and you're swinging? And she said, yeah, but it really didn't work out too well. And I went, hold on a second. Why don't we start right there, okay? And I began to counsel them. There's, there was very little, if any, remorse over their sexual activity that they were engaging in, and yet they, they saw themselves as strong Christians, you know? And so I began to talk to them about sex, what sex was created for in the Bible. I'm like, look, sex is pure in Scripture. It's beautiful. And God created marriage between a man and a woman, and that was strategic. Those two, the genders represent spiritual truth. God is the husband, the church is the wife. And marriage was created to symbolize that union. Your marriage is a message about Jesus and the church, okay? And sex was created as the ultimate intimacy, and you're actually supposed to invite God into that. So stop watching pornography and stop committing adultery together. That's going to destroy your marriage, I promise you. That's the kind of thing that was happening in this church and it's happening in the church today. You know, I, I can't tell you how many situations I've seen as a pastor over the years. I've been in ministry for 30 years. And I can tell you there's a lot of deviant sexual behavior happening in the church without any shame. And Jesus says, you know, there's, there's a problem here. And there's a lot of dabbling in the occult in the church. Okay, so... You know, uh, horoscopes, seances. I'm going to go get my palm read. I can't tell you how many Christians I've, have engaged in this, you know. I, I, see, I saw it a lot in Louisiana. You know, people go to New Orleans. Hey, let's go get our palm read by this palm reader over here. No, that's false religion. That's idolatry. And there's no check in the spirit. If there's no check in the spirit, if you're not hearing the Holy Spirit say, caution, 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 that's a lie. There's a problem. Jesus says that is a major warning sign. That is not of God. That's dangerous. Third sign, the Thyatira sign, church at Thyatira. Uh, they struggle with tolerance for evil influence within their church. Okay, Revelation 2, verses 20 through 21. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants. So see, Jesus is saying there, there are real Christians in this church, but they're being misled into sexual immorality. So Jesus doesn't really have a, I mean, he doesn't like that his servants are misled, but he doesn't have a problem with temptation or you're confused or whatever. He has a problem with people who know better that are tolerating this. By her teaching, she misleads my servants and the sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. This is an unrepentant woman. So there's a woman named Jezebel that's in this church. She has appointed herself a prophet. So in other words, she's claiming that she has greater spiritual maturity than everybody, and she's got secrets. She's got spiritual insight that other people don't have, including the pastor of her church, okay? And uh, Jesus refers to her teachings as Satan's so-called deep secrets. She claims to be deep. You know, I'm really deep spiritually. I've seen this a number of times in churches I've pastored. Um, I've seen this at Renovation Church. When we started at New Life, when we were in the uh, World Prayer Center, I was preaching one Sunday, and a guy walks in, 
off the street, never seen him before, and he had a crazy look in his eye. His hair was all disheveled. Uh, he had a look about him, like he had been high, like he was high or something. And I've seen a lot of people. I can recognize that. And so this dude, there was something off right when he walked into the door. It was right after I preached. And uh, he comes up to me, he introduces himself, and he says he's a prophet. He claims this title, a prophet. He goes, I live up in the mountains, and I listen to God, and I'm a prophet. And I have a word for this church. And he was asking me to give him the pulpit in front of you guys. And I, was, I just said, well, I appreciate that, brother. That, that's not going to happen here. And, you know, basically, you know, I, esc I escorted him out because my spider sense was going off, you know? This guy was a false prophet. Very clearly, it was some, I think he had some kind of mental illness. I've seen this over and over again. Uh, I was at another church uh, one time. It's always a red flag when people come to me and they tell me they're really mature in the Lord, right? When you lead with that, I don't say that. I don't. You know, I'm a pastor, but, I, you know, I, I'm really uncomfortable saying I'm super mature in the Lord because I know my weaknesses. But anyway, um, guy, there was a, I was at another church, and this was a big church. It was a massive church in the community that I was pastoring, and uh, the, this dude, there was a guy in the community that had a compound. He had managed to raise money. He had proclaimed himself a... Bible teacher, and he got, somehow got on the radio, and uh, he bought this camp, and he would have these conferences, and they, he, the camp was about 30 miles from our church, and, you know, I, there were some people in our church supporting him, and so when I, when I became the pastor of this church, I hear about this guy, and I'm like, I, I was talking to my executive pastor, and I said, tell me about this dude. He goes, man, I think he's off, and I didn't know much about him. One day, I'm preaching. This dude comes into my church, and at the end of the sermon, he, he comes up to me, and we're standing in the sanctuary, and he proceeds to make an argument to me claiming that the Bible is okay with multiple wives. He goes, you know, God has no problem if a man has more than one wife at the same time. And I'm like, brother, that is unbiblical. I said, Genesis chapter 2 makes that very clear. When God made marriage, he said, one man, one woman. That's the biblical definition of marriage. Anytime you see polygamy in the Bible, it's a disaster. God never endorses it. It always causes problems. And in the New Testament, St. Paul himself says, one man, one woman. He reaffirms, he quotes Genesis chapter 2. And by the way, so does Jesus. That is unbiblical. And as soon as I heard him say that, by the way, Cults often have deviant sexual behavior, very often. You dig down deep enough, there's something, something lustful going on. So, you know, I informed my executive power, uh, pastor, uh, elders, and everything. This guy cannot be endorsed in our church any longer. This church tolerated that, that kind of business in their church, out of the, the idea of we need to accept everybody. You know, and we have a problem with that in our country. Tolerance doesn't mean we accept everything. Tolerance means we love everybody, okay? They're accepting false doctrine. They're accepting false prophets in their church. Jesus would say to you and say to me, be very careful of, of people who have a lot of charisma, who have some kind of shtick. Uh, there, they have some talent to draw people, but they're teaching false theology. And don't get influenced by these people. Do not tolerate that kind of thing in your life. If you are, if you have some super spiritual person that's teaching you stuff that contradicts the Bible, that's a warning sign, okay? Next warning sign is the Sardis Church. I know I'm going long here. Apologize for that. Almost done. And this is a lethargic faith, Revelation 3, verses 1 through 2. I know your deeds. You have a, rep a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God, my Father. So uh, Jesus says if your walk is lifeless, there's a problem. That's a warning sign. By the way, he also says to these churches, I will remove your light. 
In other words, I'm going to shut your church down if you continue doing this. And haven't you in your life seen dysfunctional churches shut down? I have many times. I'm seeing entire denominations being shut down right now. There are entire denominations in our country who have rejected the Bible as the Word of God and no longer think Jesus is God's Son. And guess what, happen, what is happening to those churches? They're closing their doors. Churches that believe the Bible and teach the gospel, guess what's happening to them? They're booming in America right now. God will take away his light from a church that is a false church. All right, next warning sign is the Laodicea sign, which is a casual middle of the road faith, verses 15 through 16. He says to the church at Laodicea, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Pretty strong language. If you ever had a cup of coffee that was neither hot nor really cold? Not hot coffee and it's not iced coffee. It's been sitting in a cup for two hours in your kitchen. You take a sip of it. What's it like? You don't like that. And Jesus says that a middle of the road faith is like that to him. It's, it's not enjoyable. This has to do with lethargy or a very superficial faith. Let me give you a situation that I think fits that. Uh, some time ago, I got a call from somebody, and, and, the, and I'm going to change this for confidentiality purposes a little bit, but this guy calls me. He doesn't even go to my church. And he says, Pastor, I need your help. I don't even know how you got my number. And I said, okay, how can I help you? And he said, well, you know, I'm a strong Christian. He goes, I'm, I'm really close to Jesus. Jesus and I are really tight. Okay, I'm a mature Christian. But I'm having a problem in my marriage, and I want to divorce my wife. And so he's asking me to help him divorce his wife. And I said, well, hang on a second. Have you gone to your pastor and gotten any counsel about this? You know, have you talked to the spiritual authority that's over you? And, and the leaders of that church, have you sought their help? And he said, oh, well, no, we're, my wife and I aren't going to church right now. You know, COVID came, we kind of got out of going to church, so we're not going to church right now. I said, okay, and you know, that's red flag number one. And I said, well, what's the problem with your marriage? And he goes, you know, she's just not nice to me. She's not very nice to me. And he goes, I just can't put up with it anymore. You know, I'm just, I think it's time to get a, a divorce. And the dude is asking me to help him get, divorce his wife. I said, well, has she been unfaithful to you? Has she had an affair on you? No. Well, what? Okay. Uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just going to be honest with you, brother. You, you've told me some things that are a concern to me. Number one, you, you started this conversation saying you're a really strong Christian and you're not even going to church. Like, you're not even doing the basic. So how can you say you're a strong, mature Christian? Number two, you don't even know what the Bible says about divorce. Like, you haven't even taken the time to research what Scripture says you should do in this situation. And you need to go to your pastor, and you need to put yourself under the authority of your church and do what they say. And he immediately got off the phone with me. Now, that's the kind of thing that was going on at the Laodicea church. And Jesus says, you know, I don't like that. That's a warning sign, okay? Uh, if you claim to be committed to Christ, and you're not even doing the basics. Like, you're not going to church. You're not learning what the Bible says about life. That's a warning sign. Okay, let me close with some hope, okay? Let me close on a positive here. And let me give you some vital signs as opposed to warning signs. Vital signs that you will be raptured, okay? Here's vital sign number one. You've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you rely on his grace for salvation. Now, Jesus mentions that in chapter 1, verses 5 through 6. He says, or this is speaking about Jesus, and it says, to him who loves us, Jesus loves you, and has freed us from our sins by his blood. So you've accepted the fact that Jesus has died for your sins. He's spilled his blood for you, and he's freed you from the wrath 
that is coming. And has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve as God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. So if you've accepted the gospel, you have been freed from the judgment. And the way you know that you have really accepted the gospel is your faith shows evidence of that by its real life, your holiness, your passion, and your consistent lifestyle for Jesus, okay? So there are two more church signs that are very hopeful in chapters two through three. One is the Smyrna sign, the church at Smyrna. Jesus says to them, be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Faithfulness, meaning consistency in your walk with God is evidence that you truly know God. Jesus says that to the Smyrna church, and he also says that to the last church we're gonna look at today, which is the Philadelphia church, the Philadelphia sign. And yes, the city of Philadelphia was named after this church by William Penn. But in chapter three, verse 10, it says this, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, so you're consistently, you're enduring patiently, you're consistently living for Jesus, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, that's the tribulation, that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. This church showed evidence of real faith. And their consistent, enduring lifestyle showed that they really did believe the gospel. And Jesus says clearly that they will be raptured. He says, I will keep you from the hour of trial. Now, some Bible teachers will say that the rapture is not in the Bible. I've already showed you that the rapture is in the Bible. We saw it in black and white. It's even, in, even called rapture in the Latin Bible. But they also claim it's certainly not in the book of Revelation. Well, it, is, it most certainly is in the book of Revelation. It's right here. Jesus says, if you have accepted the gospel, if you're living the gospel, I will keep you from the hour of trial. He doesn't say, I'm going to get you through the hour of trial. He says, I'm going to keep you from it. I'm going to keep you away from it. How does he do that? He does that through the rapture. So let me close with this. You need to be sure that you are God's. You need to be sure that you are God's. I think that's a message of these two chapters. And so let's make sure that you are right now. And the way that you, you're sure is you accept the gospel, you believe the gospel, and you live the gospel. That's the evidence that you've accepted it. So let's make sure of that right now. Would you close your eyes with me and we'll close out the service with this. Father, I wanna thank you for your word. Uh, there was a lot here. We covered a lot of ground. It's like drinking from a fire hose. But I thank you for the insight, the x-ray that you gave us this morning of our souls. And maybe you're here this morning, somebody's here this morning, and you've looked at the x-ray results, and you're, 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 you're like, I have a problem. I see some of these warning signs in my life. You've been found wanting. Well, let's make it right, right now. If that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me silently. Just repeat it in your heart before Christ. Lord, I want to thank you for speaking me to, to me today. I am far from you. I haven't truly believed in you. My actions say that. So right now, I give you my life. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I accept the blood that you spilled to pay for my sins on the cross. I accept your payment for my sins. I believe you rose again. And from this point forward, I'm going to live that belief. My life is going to be like the Philadelphia church. I'm going to endure trial. I'm going to live consistently. I'm going to really try to be holy, and I'm going to ask you to help me. From this point on, you are my king. I will live for you, and I will share you with others. I give you my life. I pray this 
in Jesus' name, amen. Please, everybody, keep your eyes closed. If you prayed that prayer, would you, would you raise your hand really high? Let me see you uh, and agree with you that today is the day you've accepted Christ, okay? We've had three people accept Christ this morning. Lord, I want to thank you for them. I pray that this would be the beginning of a tremendous transformation in their lives. Let them shine like Philadelphia with brotherly love, the love of Christ, and let them experience you like they have never experienced you before. Now, Lord, we lift up our offering. We pray that it would be pleasing in your sight. We love you. Thank you for meeting with us in this service. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the strong Son of God. And everybody said... Amen. Thanks for being with us today. If you would like to partner with us in this ministry and give, you can do so at therenovationchurch.org.